Testing. Okay, we're recording. And you're seeing nothing but a smart old owl. Come on, there you go. All right, so uh, session 11, we're talking about the chapter from Chris Petter, uh, the best practices context from his from his book, uh, Multidimensional Evidence-Based Practices, reading assignment for this week. Uh, Petter defines best practices as those behaviors, methods, interventions, attitudes, and knowledge which represent the state of art in a particular area or field of practice. So uh, I think one of the important things of those, I mean, we know behaviors, we, we know about methods and interventions and knowledge, but attitude is an important part of, of best practice. Let's not go into that in a second. Uh, but what is practice? Practice is the direct service program level professional actions that are undertaken to ameliorate or prevent problems and symptoms among a target population of clients or consumers, that according to Petter. And, um, <clears throat> and Petter um, puts those two together uh, uh, and, and to think about best practices. And there, and there are a number of best practices um, um, programs out there. For example, here at the uh, UN Habitat for a, a Better Urban Future, there's many, 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 many best practices uh, available around uh, a number of different uh, uh, projects ranging from homelessness uh, to, um, to land, land and housing, disaster management, social inclusion, urban development, uh, so a lot of this stuff at the at the UN are, is going to be kind of macro based best practices. So it's one good resource that uh, he provides for us there. Um, another one is the National um, uh, Governors uh, Association, uh, which has again a number of best practices for um, more more local areas around again. A number of of, um, of um, uh, mostly macro level interventions. So, um, not going to be quite as as, as perhaps big as uh, what we find from the UN. Um, so, what is best, and who gets to say what is best? Um, <clears throat> we're going to talk today about uh, practice based research empirically based research, evidence-based practice, knowledge-based practice, and then finally uh, uh, bring it all together in multidimensional evidence-based practice. So, so what practice-based research is, is uh, a grassroots approach to establishing evidence of effectiveness. Those are the kind of things that agencies do and have done for quite a long time to affirm that their programs are uh, doing what they, they, they say they're going to do, that they're, that they're being effective to their, to their consumer. Uh, it is accomplished uh, by mechanisms uh, which effectively monitor and improve service delivery and outcomes. And much of this gets accomplished through the process of data mining. And that's using existing information within your agency to discover what's going on. And you know those of you who know anything about um, um, big data from kind of contemporary times may think, oh, this is a recent phenomenon. But if you remember your social work history, going back to Mary Richmond, uh, she did data mining to make cases to to legislatures and city councils and whatnot why her programs needed to be funding. You know by by. Uh, uh, the use of retrospective analysis of routinely collected data, uh, such as case records, which is exactly what Mary Richmond did over 100 years ago, uh, to advance the cause of the social work um, 
uh, mission. Uh, uh, <clears throat> sometimes we have to rely on easily gathered data. Say, for example, um, uh, in 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 the chapter there was a, there was a number of links that somehow didn't work right. Uh, one of them was to to um, uh, a, a set of simple session scales um, and um, um, which are freely available for for individuals to to get and. Um, 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 <clears throat> use in their program. So I'm not going to go through the process here, but you can do it. Um, but again, easily gathered data is not as good as data that you already have to gather. You don't want to have to do anything other than uh, what you're doing right now because, you know, when you get into uh, being a social worker, you'll have Plenty of plenty of stuff to do without adding an easily gathered data sheet to your daily agenda. So we're going to see a couple EBPs. So kind of be on the watch out for the difference between the two. The first is empirically based practice, uh, and empirically based practice is really something of a top-down or an externally generated model. And, and it relies heavily on the positivist research model, i.e. those um, randomly selected controlled studies um, uh, using double blind as the highest, the highest uh, uh, measure. But also in social work and other behavioral sciences, we often rely on, on good, high quality uh, quasi or quasi experimental models um, and call them empirically based. Um, it does satisfy our ethical mandates that we practice, um, um, that we use uh, practices that have been shown to be effective. Um, however, truth be known, when you try to fit some of these empirically based models into everyday practice, they're often too cumbersome, too expensive, too complex, labor intensive, and time consuming. And that's often why, because these models were produced to satisfy the needs of research, not the reason, not the re needs of practitioners. So sometimes there's there's elements in in, in them that um, uh, make uh, the day to day practice um, um, that, that make implementing them in day to day practice impractical uh, or difficult to do, or in some cases. There are mechanisms that are put in, into these um, research models that were there only for research purposes that actually served an important clinical role. For example, years ago, let's go back in time, use the Wayback Machine, and uh, I was a mental health clinician in a community mental health center, and we started getting a lot of borderline personality disorder patients, clients, consumers, whatever you want to call them. Well, we were ill-equipped to deal with them, and being an ethically uh, oriented social worker, I needed training. So I started researching um, uh, what was effective with borderline personality disorders, and came across this this um, this um, program called dialectical behavior therapy. So got. Went to a workshop, looked good, got the treatment manual, got the skills building manual, studied it over, looked good. Several of us went to Menninger's, got some special training, all good to go. We started implementing it. Well, there's this, there's this one piece in there, um, which is called the, the, the daily diary cards, which when I look at them, it's like, oh, that was, that was definitely put in there for, by a researcher for research purposes. However, uh, they found that it became such an important part of the treatment relationship uh, dealing with these diary cards that uh, the, the program actually wouldn't work as well without it. So, so even though it was complex and labor intensive, it was an important part of the, um, of the, of the, of the practice. Now, evidence-based practice or the real evidence-based uh, um, uh, practice. Oh, I see a typo. I see a typo. B B. B B. 
BP, Bob. So you compare um, this to empirically based practices. <clears throat> Evidence-based practices are those that have been adapted or are more adaptable. So when we look at evidence-based practice, we again, we looked, what does the research tell us? What does the best research tell us? And again, those, those, um, um, those empirical articles that are, that are randomly selected in clinical trials are, are usually sitting on a higher plane uh, with evidence-based practices than other types of re research. Uh, but we also consider our professional wisdom and our values. What does our personal experience tell us works? And what do our clients have to offer? Um, um, <clears throat> that's kind of the idea of it, but in, in reality, uh, most practitioners will look at a uh, empirical article uh, or read a number of articles in a certain area and then um, um, uh, uh, you know, they'll look at the research, what does the research tell us, and they'll use their professional wisdom and, and their values to, uh, um, to do what they feel is right. And so, and, and they forget about the, 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 the client approach. So, evidence-based practices should be thought of as a verb, not a noun. Uh, uh, and it's a process by which practitioners can find and apply empirically-based practices to address specific client uh, problem. So that's where we end up translating the research into direct practice. Um, uh, when we think of evidence-based practices as a noun, which often happens, uh, it, it causes us to forego the work of adapting those uh, 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 to an evidence-based practice uh, or an evidence-based uh, practice to our context. So, so we tend to want to just do what the, the research tells us to do and not consider our context or our clients. And that's not the way we should do it. <clears throat> now, knowledge-based practice is something that has come out of, um, out of England and it's, um, it's fairly, um, uh, fairly established now as an idea. Uh, but it's the first kind of uh, uber idea that brings in the client as an important uh, uh, player in the uh, uh, decision making about what's best practices. Uh, although in reality the client has always been the decider because they vote either with their feet or by um, not participating fully in, 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 in the treatment. Uh, so the client and the professional decide if and how an evidence-based and empirical evidence is implemented. However, um, uh, uh, it is still empirical evidence that is, is contextualized and not other sources of knowledge, and that's really important. Uh, for example, um, uh, uh, the, um, oh, what's that called, SCIE, um, was established, it's best practices, uh, knowledge-based practices uh, organization in the UK. Uh, uh, social care, intervention, evidence, uh, I read it and I forgot what it is. Um, the organization produces reports and other resources on best practices in social care. And they focus on guidelines of, of what is useful to consumers. Uh, the really interesting thing about uh, this collaboration or this consortium is um, that they include consumers in all stages of a review. So it isn't just some uh, um, uh, academic group deciding um, um, what needs to be reviewed and then later getting the buy-in from the consumers. It's, um, uh, it's consumers being involved from the formation of the question about what is best practices to the summary of the findings. So it's, it's an important advancement in, in, in the thinking of our relationship with consumers and the kind of treatment models that we use. In knowledge, um, knowledge based practice, um, they start to recognize that there are multiple types of knowledge. So sometimes it's policy knowledge, 
what does policy and procedures and, and legislative um, uh, edicts demand that we do. And that's an important part of an, uh, uh, an, an initial review is to, is to look at, at the authority that we have to do or not do. We have organizational knowledges uh, that, that both uh, uh, create uh, knowledge and disseminate knowledge through, through the use of things like practice surveys. Uh, 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 practice knowledge um, is actively sought, practice directly sought from practitioners. User knowledge, again, consumers who serve on the review team. Uh, 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 are an important part of knowledge-based services. And finally, research knowledge, which of course is, is what we're all familiar with. But of the, the groups we've looked at so far, um, knowledge-based practices is the one that uh, both include qualitative and quantitative studies that is systematically searched, assessed for quality, quality and summarized. And I think you know it's important to to highlight this this assessed for quality because that's that's one thing that that um, sometimes eludes us, particularly if we're looking for for a, um, a a quick answer to a problem, or if we run across some article that kind of um, justifies a position we may already hold. Uh, the um, uh, uh, task of the literature review person is to both uh, give us the what is being reported, but but how much uh, stock can we place in the quality of that research project or the quality of that uh, report. Knowledge-based um, uh, focus is, uh, uh, is outcomes focused. Uh, uh, so it goes beyond just looking for looking at using empirical evidence. Uh, it uh, uh, it uh, monitors outcome using after aftercare surveys, for example, and and case studies. Um, the practice survey part of the knowledge uh, of, encompassed both a postal survey and in depth case studies. The latter incorporate interviews with both professionals. And users of service, so that's that's a pretty um, um, a high standard. You know, when when you as an agency are sending out postal surveys uh, and then then doing in depth case studies, and then finally interviewing professionals and users of service, that's that's a, that's, that's that's a lot. Now, multi-dimensional evidence-based practice. Uh, which really is what I'm, I'm kind of pushing you to, to uh, learn this semester, um, uh, <clears throat> is a process by, by where uh, we look at what the research says is the best practice from a quantitative and qualitative approach. What is the professional perspective or the practice wisdom? And finally, the consumer's uh, perspective, the direct consumers or the advocate's position. And it distills down through a process that you're all becoming familiar with uh, and has this kind of values added um, contextually specific best practice. And that's the thing that really uh, multidimensional evidence-based practice adds to those other ones is the sense of, of values. And you know, we in social work um, uh, are, are a values-based um, uh, profession. You know, so M MEBP includes empirical empirical based practice and emphasis on sound empirical evidence. We don't we don't mind that at all. It includes the evidence based practices, thoughtful inclusion of context. Um, it honors the knowledge based practices inclusion of the practitioner and the consumer wisdom, especially along with uh, honoring qualitative research. And it brings that all together under a values umbrella. So, um, uh, what values? Whose values? Has anybody seen these values? Petter lists uh, just three, uh, but he but he also mentions that 
that you know as, as a profession we're chock full of, of, of values and uh, some of the, the three that he mentions are adequacy, equity, and efficiency. So we'll look at each one of those in turn. Adequacy, uh, does it work? <laughs> That's a good one to ask. Uh, has a practice been proven to work with a population that you're working with? Uh, and is it known to work with the kind of resources that our agency can use uh, in the service delivery process? And, uh, and all these things are, are determined by the literature review. Uh, you know, you're starting to see, uh, see something here. It looks like a, uh, 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 the final paper, you know. Uh, equity. Equity moves beyond the very important need for the practitioner to be honoring diversity or being culturally competent. Equity from the, from the multidimensional evidence-based practice perspective tasks the practitioner and the agency to adopt a consumer-centric perspective. Say, for example, the, um, um, uh, the children's program that they described in the, in the um, um, uh, book. And, you know, I can remember back, you know, my, my, my daughter is old enough at this point that, you know, when I first started taking her to, the, to her doctor's office, her pediatrician's office, a very young child, they were in an old, older building. And, uh, and sometime between, you know, two and six, she, they moved to a, a new set of offices. Well, the old set of offices was your standard doctor's office, you know, built from a adult-centric perspective. Uh, nothing there for children to do. Uh, there was things for adults to do. There was magazines, you know, uh, uh, on the on the tables, uh, adult magazines, not not adult quote unquote adult magazines, but you know, Red Book and and uh, uh, Reader's Digest and those sorts of things. <clears throat> TV on the wall. It was on the TV. It wasn't cartoons. It was you know, one one life to live or as the world turns or some other some other daytime program. So. Uh, but the, their new um, offices, they became more children-centric because they had at least two pediatricians in their, in their practice group. And uh, so even though they saw older people uh, and they still had the, the, uh, uh, the magazines and the large chairs, they had a whole area that had small chairs, little tiny chairs, little, little uh, bins of stuffed toys and other kind of toys to play with, some of those cardboard books that don't get tore up really easily. Uh, there was things for children to do that made it friendly and inviting to them. Uh, and, and though, you know, a medical often, office we think of, well, it's all about their body and, you know, give them a pill and, you know, they'll be okay and that sort of stuff. Well, all this stuff is really important and, and even, even they came to, to, to recognize that. Uh, quite a while back. So, uh, efficiency. You know, regardless of how well an empirically proven approach works for a specific population, if society is not willing to pay for it, or if the you know the client themselves are not willing to pony up the money, then the, your practice just isn't going to happen. So, and also efficiency shouldn't always just be thought of in terms of money. Uh, you know, think of the old adage, time is money. Uh, well, how quickly an intervention works is an important part of, uh, of considering uh, what is the best practice. How much time investment a consumer must put into it must be thought of and factored into this analysis. I've, I, I've seen many good ideas come and go, and they go because... You know, there's no, you know, they'll be all, they can go to this resource center, which is in the middle of town, and there's no way to get there. This was in Johnson County where, and, and back, you know, in the day where, you know, people in Johnson County, they got to Kansas City, they got to downtown by getting in their car and driving. Well, folks with chronic mental illness and, and who are chronically poor, they may not have that car to get into, so... So efficiency is time, efficiency is money and, and effort. So here, here's the steps that Petter outlines as multi-dimensional evidence-based practice process. First of all, you identify the MEBP question. 
So using your individual go back machines, go back to earlier in the semester when you were writing about the context of your practicum. What do they do here? Who are they serving? Those sorts of the things. That's where you get to the, the, the questions. Who, who am I serving here? What kind of social problem or condition do they have that I want to be offering a practice intervention to ameliorate or eliminate their, 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 their condition? Uh, <clears throat> you know, that's what we did in that first assignment. Uh, then we, steps two through four, identify multiple sources of knowledge and evidence pertaining to the multidimensional evidence-based practice question. So these are not exactly in the same order. For example, we did step uh, four, identify sources and summarize research perspective, including both quantitative and qualitative studies. You know, your literature review, remember that? It wasn't long ago, some of you might still owe me a literature review, uh, you could be in trouble. <clears throat> Why did I do that first instead of a step four? Well, this is really designed for, for practitioners, you know, in ongoing situations. You as, as student uh, practitioners or practitioners in learning uh, uh, and at new practicums, often you don't have access to that consumer perspective. Often you don't have haven't developed the professional relationships yet to, to, to know from who and how to get get the professional perspective. So, but you're all students. You've all you've all um, to some degree know how to do uh, uh, the the identification and summarizing of research into a literature review. Then, of course, we did, we we had you uh, identify and summarize the professional perspective. And then finally, the, the consumer perspective, which comes up in a couple of weeks or next week or whenever soon, very soon. Better be working on it. Um, once you've done all that, you bring those best practices across those three perspectives back into a, uh, a, a single whole. So um, <clears throat> Remember early on in class where I drew on the board the three concentric circles, the three circles that came together and, and, and there was that sweet spot in the middle? That's what we're looking for here with uh, multidimensional evidence-based practice, that spot in the middle where consumers say this works and also professionals say this is something that works and is something that we can do here and the research says these kind of activities have shown to be effective for this kind of problem. So it's that coming together of those three sources of knowledge. <clears throat> and then finally, um, uh, um, you assess the potency of the identified best practice practices because you'll you may find multiple. You know which is the best, which is the best in context of. Of, of what we have ability to do here. And then you use uh, your value criteria to critique and improve those best practices. So and by value cri criteria, it can be a lot of different things. So say for example, um, my post-traumatic stress uh, program that I'm, that I'm working on developing uh, for Native Americans, um, uh, it's built on the platform or, 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 or the, found, the foundation of it is narrative exposure therapy, which, which identifies itself as a culturally universal treatment for traumatic stress. Ha! Huh, I go through reading this thing and there's things that, that kind of dishonor the Native American worldview. It's not like it, you know, it's, they're, they're out to get Native Americans. But because, it, because different cultural groups have different worldviews, <clears throat> there's things that need to be critiqued and improved to implement that. And, uh, um, and that's, that can be true of, of a lot of different uh, uh, things that you find you, that you want to implement, that you gotta, you gotta tweak them a little bit before you actually implement them. Um, Best practices, as 
are determined by going through a multidimensional evidence-based practice are only as good as the ongoing efforts of the, of the practitioner to identify the strengths and the weaknesses of um, their implementation. And this ongoing identification of strengths and weaknesses uh, is crucial. Uh, um, you know, you can't just decide, oh, well, here's an evidence-based practice, everybody likes it, consumers are on board with it, uh, the staff think it's going to work. Um, uh, I mean, that's all good, it's all necessary, that's all important. But we also need to, to uh, uh, ongoing effort to, to identify strengths and weaknesses in our implementation. So that involves ongoing evaluation, ongoing assessment of the effectiveness. Is it working? How well is it working? The equity, does it work equally well for people regardless of who they are as a class of people? And is it something that we can we can provide efficiently? Um, and um, and that, you know, social workers all, all often don't don't wrap their minds around efficiency. Um, you know, you do when you're when you're you know budgeting for your families. Uh, you go, oh yeah, um, you know, I, I will buy you know th this package of hamburger versus that package of hamburger because you know it's. 35 cents a pound cheaper. Um, uh, but, but programmatically, we often don't think a lot about, about the cost of, that it takes to deliver our, our services. But, it, but it's an important aspect. And, and the ongoing evaluation of that um, uh, is an important part of, 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 of the research process. It wasn't extensively covered in, in, uh, in this class because you got a whole class coming up called program evaluation. So, so there we go. My references from today came of course from our reading, Petter, Best Practices in con Context in C.G. Petter, Editor, Multidimensional Evidence-Based Practice. <clears throat> and also from an article very similar by Chris Petter and Uta Walter. Uh, I know both of those. Best Practice Inquiry at Multidimensional value critical frame framework, which is the Journal of Social Work Education. So, all right, thank you all for uh, spending the last 32 minutes, 23 seconds with me today.